Hello everyone, this is Arezu and welcome back to another episode of Arezu Art Podcast. Hope you are all keeping it safe as the world is going to open up a little bit more. I hope that things can get back to the normal soon. And this time we are all definitely going to appreciate every small things that we have in life. Here we go with episode 12 and another interview with an amazing artist. Before I introduce her to you, I would say that I truly enjoyed my conversation with her so much that it took us three hours long, but I had to trim this podcast a little bit more. You can definitely imagine how much I was enjoying my conversation with her and it was a roller coaster of emotion. We discussed a lot of topics and it was also very informative. My next guest is Tuna Bora. Unfortunately, on this podcast, I faced a technical issue and Tuna was really kind enough to re-record the questions I've asked from her in the mid part of the podcast. Nothing to worry about. I mean, the podcast is still almost two hours long. But to give you a gist of the whole podcast, Tuna Bora is an award-winning Turkish illustrator, animation director and production designer best known for her distinctive storytelling style and diverse daily sketches she puts on her social media. She has worked in many companies like Google, uh, for advertising companies, animation companies. In this episode, on the first hour, we are talking about unspoken parts of immigration and opening up yourself the way you are and the cultural difference that we have as an immigrants and all the insecurities that we might have. On the second half, we are discussing more of the process of making Pearl, which is the first VR virtual reality film to receive an Oscar nomination. And she has also won a Best Production for Annie Awards for this movie. We talk about one of her movies, A Solipsism, all the symbolic meanings behind it by my interpretation. And it was quite fun sharing uh, all my thoughts about this movie with her. We also talk about AR app, A Little Red Riding Hood, which has a contemporary twist into it. And I really enjoyed to know about the process of making it and also the important um, concept that it had behind this AR project. And last but not least, all Tuna's dedication to her daily sketches, which uh, you can see on her Instagram. And it has a versatile style and there are so many beautiful thoughts and concepts behind all of them. Honestly speaking, trimming this podcast was a bit difficult for me because I enjoyed every single word that Tuna was saying. But in a way, please read the caption. You can find uh, the whole idea of what we are discussing in each part of this podcast. So in general, if you are into AR, VR, minimalism art and production design in general and you just want to get to know another amazing artist please join me and my podcast art is art if you are enjoying this podcast don't forget to like comment and share your opinions with me and more importantly share this podcast with your friends and spread the love this is my passion project and whenever I receive more passions and feedbacks from you, it just keeps me going and fuel up my energy to make more and more interviews. Here we go everyone with Tuna Bora. Hi Tuna, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. So glad to have you here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. So good. So. Okay, I normally just start with a introduction, so I really, really want to know you are raised and born in Istanbul, a beautiful Istanbul. Tell me all about your childhood and how you raised, I don't know, with like baklava kebab or any sort of <laughs> turkey seed or I really, really want to know about your, I mean, how you get into art, how you learn English, how you immigrate and all that. And did your parents were like supportive, were they overprotective, typical parents or yeah, just tell me a whole thing, an introduction for people to know you better. Uh, of course. So 
I, I was born and raised in Istanbul. I lived in Izmir for four years in high school. Mm. Um, if I get into the food, we will not talk about anything else. <laughs> I miss so much, you know, I, like I can make some things at home, but honestly, I miss Turkish food significantly. I know, I know. There are just some things that's, yeah. I was recently thinking about that. It, this is sort of a, already a tangent, but I ended up in Gaziantep um, last year, it, which is like closer to Iran too, I guess. Uh, I don't know okay. if you guys know that city. It's very close to Syria. Kind of got, um, I think they recently got the stamp of UNESCO uh, World Heritage for Cuisine. So like, yeah, so they had like a, <laughs> culinary arts uh, museum and stuff and, and they had like a culinary arts restaurant where you know um, oh gosh okay <laughs> that's we're working at and stuff and it was so exciting and I came back with like bags of spices <laughs> I know old school things I bet Tehran is like this too but you know like there's the there's the really modern part and then in Turkey you've been to Istanbul so you know this yeah, there's yeah, the yeah. Are, which is where you know it, it's eight, yeah. it's 700 years old we do not go there it's for tourists <laughs> but you walk in and it's just spice like there's a spice cellars and yeah and yeah, yeah. Turkish it smells delight. good though it smells oh, good yeah. oh yeah. yeah but I became the person my friends are all mocking me because I became the person who's just going to <laughs> become a tourist I love being a tourist being a tourist yeah. in Istanbul is great but um yeah it was just like buying things like you know dried roses to bring back it was just weirdest stuff which i'm sure you know right yes exactly right yeah, yeah. <laughs> you usually have- like the the if, if you just uh somehow regret and then come back to your hometown you're like your bag will be like full of food spices and we in particular use uh, saffrons yeah <laughs> For years, I would bring back like Turkish chips and things oh. um, that my friends were obsessed with. We had a uh, peanut flavored um, like puffs. Which okay, is okay. Basically, like a thing of my childhood. It's so weird. The 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 gifts are really strange. There's like really precious gifts and then chips. It's really hard to explain to people who have not immigrated why <laughs> you're coming back to the country with a bag full of chips. You know? <laughs> The right people will know. So it was great. Growing up in Turkey was excellent. Also, it happened at a very good time. I think there was a lot of interesting things happening in Turkey in the 90s and early 2000s. It, it felt really relaxed. And mm-hmm. um, there were interesting thing happen- things happening in the arts. So I grew up in, in like a really happy Istanbul, which yeah. over time, there's a lot more uh, division now in the city. I think like there was always a lot of tension, but it was friendlier in a way. Now it feels yeah. quite different, yeah, since I left. But my parents were very supportive. Uh, I, I come from a very unusual Turkish family. <laughs> Most of my family are, they were teachers, writers, artists, and then, you know, that creates a pretty difficult environment for a parent to reject a child's interest in the arts when <laughs> they've done okay. I think if they were worried about it, they didn't They didn't show that very much. So mm-hmm. they were very supportive, very, very, very supportive. And you know this, it's different. The culture is different around education, right? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is it the same in Iran where if you're going to university, it is mostly your parents paying for university. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Also, like, um, I mean, the typical mindset is usually that you have to either be doctor, lawyer, or I don't know, engineer. So, right. I mean, right. art wasn't a thing. So, I mean, education is so important, of course. But yeah, I mean, um, I think the yeah. This is, it's also like changing. I mean, the older generation are also getting uh, more open-minded about the fact that let people and their children to choose whatever they like, especially like the generation after me. Um, You know, it seems understandable that our parents' generation, they lived in a different political world, right? So they are much more concerned with whether you can provide for yourself or not than are you loving what you do? Because... I don't know, like, it's really easy to judge that idea that, of course, yeah. it's the work as a doctor, you know, whatever, it's not, I'm not interested in doing it. But, <laughs> right, like, they, they, they came from a time where scarcity was different. And, and, you know, you had to have those jobs. Yeah. And they saw what happened to people who didn't have those jobs. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's a very emotional thing. I can, I can feel it from most yeah. parents. 
you know? Yeah. But now that you can make money off of being a YouTube star, for instance, I think yeah, it's a little like they understand if you can make American dollars and live. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, as long as you can. Is, is rarely discussed. I know we talked briefly and you were in the UK, but both dollar and sterling hold really high against yeah, yeah. our currencies, right? So, and it's very volatile. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the time I was studying here, I think the exchange rate, uh, I, I swear I'm, I have a point with this, but the exchange rate went from, I think, I don't know, like two and a half dollars to a lira to at times six dollars to a lira um sorry a lira to six dollars the other way around yeah, and yeah like if your parents are working in another yeah. country and the income that they have or the money they have keeps uh, losing yeah. value at the like value, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the even if you have i don't know maybe you too like if you had a financial aid or whatever even if your yeah. uh tuition amount seems remains the same and let's say yeah, it's exactly affordable let's say it was yeah yeah you got three thousand dollars a year which is unheard of but like yes like you got yeah. all the scholarships that three thousand dollars can immediately the next year be okay it's so double for you yeah, yeah, yeah right? exactly double triple or even worse yeah 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 and it's really stressful like even for you yeah yeah it's for everyone you know i think it's something that most of the people who live in other countries do not get especially like right now with the economical crisis here you even for your like simple daily i don't know um shopping or something that you go and get some food for yourself basic foods and then the price is normally like if you're somewhere it's the same, but in here, the price just go, rise and goes up and, you know, so yeah, so it's really like uh, difficult to make ends for some people and it's really sad. But but again, like if you immigrate, it's also the same as you mentioned, the value of your money just decreases, and it's so stressful, honestly. Yeah, yeah, there's a feeling <clears throat> like if we are really realistic about what it is like to immigrate from this part of the world to, you know, a part with a higher currency, let's just say, <laughs> like a like a currency that trades higher. I think, honestly, most likely your parents can afford it. Like, it's, it's rare that you can do that without yeah. any kind of financial support from your parents. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a weird concept to say some of my American friends who, of course, have to pay for college by taking out a loan, which yeah. all of this stuff is so opaque when you're coming from another country what it really costs someone to pursue their dream it's difficult but in different channels right yeah. so there is a feeling my dad thankfully like i i have so much to thank him for my dad is really serious he, he was he took it really seriously that me and my brother's education would come first you know yeah. like make great sacrifices himself so then we could yeah. have thing and you mm -hmm. know someone is working that hard you I, so i was a little bit I was crazy hyper vigilant, right? Like I, my friends were all confused because I didn't explain it to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I was sort of so dedicated to the point of it seemed insane to people. Like they didn't understand. They thought I was just ambitious. And I'm like, no, <laughs> right? It's, I understand from a very weird place how much there is on this one thing because yeah. it, it was a sort of gamble right yeah. like I don't yeah. know about your situation but for me it was yeah. university they were helping me and I had also some kind of scholarship which helped a lot but yeah exactly. I knew I was alone the moment I graduated right yes. like I yes to earn money to stay here and exactly everything. yes oh and yeah back on something so there is this sense of lack of safety yeah, even yeah. when you know everybody's working so hard and you kind There's of agreed on everything yeah. yeah like my dad would honestly rather kill himself than like let me come back i know the amount of sacrifice he was willing to make for me so right but you know that even then there is a chance that like they want to make you feel as secure as possible but you're like what's gonna happen because i mean yeah. look at this moment right this teaches us a lot where this could happen and nobody knows nobody knows where the next year is gonna be right yeah. and i think that uncertainty is always there and yeah. at the very end of the day you realize when you zoom out from your problems you realize for a little bit more clearly you never know what's gonna happen next it's yeah. just 
we kind of feel it a little bit compounded at all times, right? There's yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly know what you mean. Because I also like got a full of scholarship to go to the UK. So I mean, it comes from a lot of I don't know, yeah, like you have to like work double harder to get into a university that only like gets six people, you know, or and gives only like one scholarship to one people. And yeah. you have to really like yeah. be focused yeah. and to, in order to get there, you know. And you know that for example, like the tuition for international students are even double more than the I mean yeah. the people in the country as well. So uh it yeah, I mean it was the same. Actually my my, my situation was that I exactly what you mentioned the point that you graduate is the most unsafe feeling that you have in your life so I was literally like I remember like myself calling every single studio in UK and not even like emailing them twice three times but also calling them and asking them if they do get like internships if they get like jobs or something but uh, you know even if you have those or you have the skills or the same level as the people who are like in Europe or UK again the visa is something and the political things are something that you have to face with so they were not really willing to pay for extra I don't know thousand or two thousand sponsorship thing to help me while they can have someone for free you know so then again you have to <laughs> work three times harder to get there in, in yeah. order to get that sponsorship. Sort of like a walking a tightrope, right? Yeah. Or like it's jumping through, you're like the lion jumping through 20 <laughs> flaming hoops, right? It's It always feels like that. And it kind of doesn't end until you find your own ground wherever you're yeah. trying to go, but that takes a while. So there's definitely the increased amount of stress. And, and like you said, when I sometimes forget how much work it was because I live around people who mostly yeah. didn't have to do the same things. Also not to mention, while I have a lot of international student friends or other artists here, LA is a hub for a lot of people yeah. coming, which I actually, I actually really like. But immigrating here from England, as difficult as it would be, is nowhere near as difficult as immigrating here from the Middle East, yeah. right? It's, it, yeah, yeah. it's not a, an imagined thing. There literally is, if you hold a Turkish passport, every yeah. time I go somewhere, I have to go through, you know, months of bureaucracy to get the permission to go to the country. And I have to, it's very invasive. Like you have to show your bank accounts, what you own. Wow, a lot of documents. The top. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really intense. And, and one, I don't know about the UK because UK, visa wise in my experience was far more organized <laughs> in the states because americans don't need visas to anything like to go anywhere every yeah. time you have to travel somewhere else you fall through the cracks really quickly you know in, in turkey they figure this out because we need visas there are travel agencies and you just show up with your paperwork they give you a list they take yeah, your yeah, yeah. and in a few days it comes back with your visa or rejection or whatever they want to do yeah. But yeah, there are things like that. You could pay your school tuition, jump through all these hoops and then not get the visa. It's it's yeah. soul crushing. You're constantly in this intense level of anxiety, like every angle, every place you look at, there's a new <laughs> Thanks for understanding. Yes, yes, exactly. Like that's why, I mean, it's really funny. <laughs> like I always like have plan A. Okay, mm -hmm. this is this and then plan B and these days, it just gets more intense that I might have plan C too because things might not work the same way that I want. And, you know, sort of like it's, it's somehow like if you want to see it in a positive way. Yeah, I mean, it makes yeah. you like really flexible in life and tough. And yeah. uh, but it's really like funny when uh, I'm talking about all these insecurities and tensions and stresses that you have to go through just for something that you really love and you want to do and you are, I mean, committed to it. Yes. Uh, it's really funny that somehow like people take it for granted and they don't realize how blessed they are for just really simple things really really simple things what's really interesting though i mean okay so it is a lot more startup work for us right mm -hmm. but i think the amount of being able to 
do complex things and remain flexible, it does give you a superpower once you kind of arrive here. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily yeah. make the connection that being tough and strong is good. I think that takes something away from you too. And, yeah. and it is your journey. It is your life's journey to figure out, right? Who, how you're going to be the person you were in your heart, in your own culture, in another place. So you have to open up, like, you know, at some point you have to open up and surrender to that. It's it's really an unspoken part of immigration is yeah. what are you going to take in? Where are you going to release that? Because, you know, I work with a lot of people that are lovely and a lot of them haven't really had to grow up in that way. Right. So yeah. their expectations and understanding of things are so different. And in some ways you seem like a child to them or you seem like because you didn't grow up in the same way. And yeah. honestly, takes a lot of courage to embrace it I think you know for for you too I think I hope you're not going to be the only woman in the room often but you will often be the only Iranian in the room you'll yes the person of color in the room it is yes. these aren't inherently bad things but they're lonely and I don't think yeah. we talk about that a lot it's sometimes yeah. just difficult because it's lonely because you want to feel supported and you want to feel understood and sometimes being somewhere else you do have to for a long time i didn't understand that when people people would see me they would first see me as all these other things and not just the person that i am mm -hmm. i think you have to insist on being yourself and that part doesn't come naturally yeah. sometimes because you look at other people who are in a similar situation and it's a lot of it's a lot of weight like it, it's it's a bittersweet thing yeah when you can own it i think people always respond positively like if you say this is different for me please understand it, it people people are i i believe inherently maybe it sounds naive but i think people are good like people want to be good so if you can explain to them what's going on often people try to be there for you and i think that's beautiful also that's how you know <laughs> when they're <laughs> people you should work with when you're like honest and open and the other person can't meet you you kind of know that's that's gonna be a difficult tension but yeah like we talked a little bit about how um some of the people who succeed from our hometowns right they are independent artists i think it's what what is really beautiful is when they come to the world stage in in some way they're very much themselves and um yeah like wanting to be a part of someone else's empire there's something strange about that you always have to keep an eye on what you're having to sort of put put to the second priority like is that you is that how you feel and and who you are or right like yeah sometimes, yeah sometimes it's okay like you go work somewhere because you're learning so much about making things and maybe the next thing for you is to sit down and make your own thing i stopped being as cagey about that right mm -hmm. i have yeah so it it, it takes a lot of courage but yeah but i know like one thing i really love about turkey and again i've never been to iran sadly but all my iranian friends there is a lot of heart there is never a lack of courage there's never a lack of warmth and sort of i think about this all the time even with turks you've not met if you sit down and you're having a meal right and you're worried the sentiment is don't let it get to you we'll figure out a way even if it seems impossible to do right yeah. People will say, we'll go at it with you for as long as it takes. We'll figure something out, you know? And I love that. Like, there's this yeah. sort of sincerity into whatever they do. When they see that true desire in your heart, right? People yeah. want to be a part of it. And it's really beautiful to me. Yeah, so true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I'm getting emotional right now. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no you're, just, you're just saying like be beautiful introduction like oh god yeah yeah and you're just touching on stuff that are I just think really matter because yeah I mean you, you know and I just feel like that we as like immigrants uh, we are really like adaptable also learning other cultures more often than the other side like that's how you, I mean, there is a sort of like you want to feed in, but you are, I mean, and because you also like in our culture, we really like grew up with a lot of like Western media and all that. So we are really familiar with most of the things that are happening there as well. But somehow like we are, our 
sort of like the other side of the culture and our set of parties unknown to others that if what you just mentioned about like being so courageous about like accepting it yourself as the way you are and just being open and explain things to others that okay this is how i am this is how my i don't know my culture works my mind works so this is the way that i grew up i i grew up with these i don't know like insecurities or stuff so uh, what you mentioned like a lot of times that uh, it's not like that people are like that or something they will understand that most of them will understand it's just the fact that there is the lack of i don't know knowledge out there so if you just let them know they will know and they understand too like that's how i mean the beautiful thing about like human connections and having a lot of like international friends or such that you pick a lot of beautiful things from every culture so i would say that's how make us what we are somehow so yeah it's a little lost on us when we're full of dreams trying to go somewhere that if you go somewhere else you volunteered to be always translating and always trying to communicate the fact that you see the world differently there they don't have access to your other world only you do and you're the one entering their world it's a little bit like driving <laughs> and merging into someone else's lane right they're always if you hit them it's always your fault because you're merging into their lane yeah. that's how people see it kind of because like you know the idea makes sense right that person's yeah interesting yeah. Has alert because they're not the one they have the right away and it always feels a little bit like that and and I think what I'm saying comes from the last few years of like really understanding that when I was much younger <laughs> and I came here to study and I wanted to work at these companies it really was more like a pipe dream because blog spot was starting to happen mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like it's yes just war. <laughs> i was there no i was Twitter, there no Instagram. yeah and and i think i remember i came here i didn't know anybody in la um going to school was helpful because you have like some kind of an environment right and it's just a bunch of other students they're young i'm young you're in the same city as all these places you want to work for and there's absolutely no way of getting in touch with them right like now you could go on LinkedIn or whatever. You could find these people so easily. You could go to events and find them. And, you know, people became very accessible over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Not only are people individually accessible, but you can see what their work is. You can listen to podcasts with them and figure out like, right. And all those years, my initial worry because of all this immigration stuff, mostly because I felt responsible towards my family, right? Yeah. Um, it's And it's funny because they want me to just chase my dream. And I'm like, I just want to make sure that like th this is a good investment for you too because I see what it, you know, how much you're working. Like it's, it's a weird kind, it's not, it's not a exchange. It's not an exchange like a transactional thing it's different yeah right? yeah yeah it's also it's, it's still like a, a straight line and just one one from a to b that you just hit the goal yeah. and you're done you have to just yeah. go through a lot of pause a lot of like yeah. process and a lot of like i mean not only the process of the work and whatever you have to go through but also my process yeah. that you there are a lot of thoughts and all that yeah it's really easy to feel completely lost because you come like i remember my own immigration period was asking a lot of people and not finding answers and then it's like do you stop there do you know like at what point do you stop and for me it was never <laughs> you never stop <laughs> like if I have to, because that's what my brain kept going back to. And I think it was nice not to have a plan B. Like I was just deliriously like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do everything that needs to be done that's because good, look, yeah. look at what else had to be done. Look at how many hours, how many vacations my dad never got to take. How many, you know, it's like to, for me, it was a huge drive for me. It was huge huge yeah I wanted to do this thing and I'm insisting on doing this thing and they're they're supporting they're not putting this pressure but yeah it's um I hired a lawyer to talk to and understand American laws so I could figure out what my options were like I would I'm like do I need to learn the American judicial system okay let's go let's do it like and people were like what are you doing yeah <laughs> you know? yeah yeah Oh, do I need to start a company? Okay, I'm going to figure out corporate American law. I'm going to sit down and figure it out and that's we're going to do. So that's why I think there's this 
Like, it's not because I'm smarter. Do you know what I mean? It's not because I'm yeah. great. It's because... <laughs> It's like, okay, these are my conditions. What am I going to do with it, you know? And um, in hindsight, like, I was insane. But it, it, for me, it needed to happen. It was like failure is not an option, you know? So um, what I was going to say is when you're under that kind of stress, I think the first, and, and, you know, it worked for me. So I'm not dissing it. I'm not saying this is the wrong way to go. But at the time, I couldn't see any other options but to look at people who were going to towards the things I wanted and trying to reverse engineer their life, right? Mm -hmm. How did you contact these people? How did you get your work in front of them? What do you need to show them? All this stuff, which now if you go online, you could figure out what you need to show people. It's like quite easy to figure out. But it's when they were first starting to print art of books. Before that, you don't even know it goes into a film. You just see the film. Like, that's all there is yeah. to it. You know? yeah. It's even when you look at those books and people's work, honestly, working on a production is a lot different than all the cool artwork you see. It's a lot mm. of work work. And yeah. if you're up to it, it's, it's you know, people who work at these companies are generally very nice. Like, it's not, it's a good environment. They try to fight for you. Uh, I'm not going to defend corporate jobs necessarily I do prefer doing independent work but the truth is you'll show up and people will try to make you happy that's also a part of it you know so mm -hmm. it's very easy to a start doing things that they're not you like you can do them but they're not you yeah. um, and it's very easy to get lost in that um, you always have to keep the other side of you alive the part that originally was interested in following this thing that you, your weird ideas and the stuff that doesn't fit into all these boxes it gets so tiring doing the day work that you mm -hmm. can't home and feel depleted and just sort of binge on things you can binge on sort of conversations you can binge on food or watching things mindlessly right like watching reruns of the same show you've seen that <laughs> time because you just want comfort and relax, like, because it's work, it's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that stuff is lost on a lot of people. I talked to a lot of friends who've been in the industry for a long time. And when you get to the bottom of it, people are, you know, really, it's, it's a kind of dire play. Like, America is pretty intense, right? Yeah. There, there's no cultural safety, like social safety nets. Yeah. And people aren't really aware that if you have two kids and a wife and you're trying to pay your mortgage, you're not so yeah. like being artistically uh, fed is sometimes not your top priority. And and yeah. I used to judge that when I was younger. But honestly, I see it as as people find meaning and joy and self-worth in not just one thing. And that's essentially mm -hmm. good. Like we're we're meant to be a little bit different. All of us, you know, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. It takes a while to relax and accept all of that, you know, that, you know, a lot of us immigrate because we want to work in a particular industry that doesn't quite exist, like not to the same extent in our country. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we want to do the, um, it feels like our visibility will come through that. And I think inherently to set yourself up to feel some kind of stability to like to accomplish the basics of the life you want, something that feels kind of safe and stable for you in another country. That is so much work and it's almost impossible, <laughs> right? It's not impossible, but it feels, yeah, feels yeah, yeah. like a lot. So all of that is already so much work that in the race to get that done, it is really easy to forget. Cool doesn't necessarily mean Pixar. Like Pixar is nice. All the people at work I know they are very nice. Like this is not yeah, yeah, yeah. singling them out. I think it's just um like or working at Disney or whatever. It's maybe it will get you followers. I don't yeah. know. Is that really yeah. do you really feel seen by that? Is like that question feels obnoxious to bring up to somebody who's worried about setting up their life, living somewhere where it's supposed to also feel better, right? Because yeah. instance, with my parents, the reason why they were so okay and driven with sending their only daughter away, right? Uh. Also a little bit this idea that I'd have a better life. But you moved to that place and your life isn't better in every way. It's better in some ways. There's the difficulties of living in that country. 
you're not yeah. there and necessarily one of them, at least not yeah. to other people. Like even mm-hmm. if you see yourself as one of them, there are all these divisions and, and they're to some extent natural, you know? Like there's there's anxiety of, I, I, it took me a long time to realize, but when you're the outsider and you come in, sometimes the anxiety of the host, this is weird, but if I may go off on another tangent, I feel like, hospitality is different in different places you yes, know yes, like yes especially we, like coming coming from our culture that hospitality is just something yeah. uh, very important it's different yeah it's very different so sometimes I, it took me a long time to realize i couldn't understand the language of hospitality here because my language of hospitality is different yes it's right? different what i sometimes sense here is if you own up to your own culture and you do want to identify with it it's sometimes seen as you're not willing to communicate with them like there's a little bit more of a are you one of us or one of them feeling and i think it's because without like philosophizing too much because i'm not a sociology major right like america is a country where you can both be american third fourth generation american even and if your households are from two different cultures you grow up differently your ideas of showing love and hospitality and support they're all different right so it's really easy to miss cues of them trying to show you that they love you um there's a lot of like stereotypes to some extent true i think in like asian far east asian families sort of not saying I love you enough, like in comparison to white families, they show love by like your mom will bring fruit, your Asian mom will bring fruit. And there are some things like that, that we understand both worlds, right? Because we're kind of, my mom would always, always do that too. So when my friend's like Korean mom brings a bunch of fruit, I'm touched like, I I, because I feel like I'm five years old and I feel like someone's petting me on the head and in a good way, like it feels so warm and welcoming and but i think if you're not from that culture of fruit being a symbol of love right yeah. it just yeah. like someone brought you fruit and it's nice so yeah like it, it i still try to learn all of that all the time it's easy to want to assimilate and think that your success will come from that and i think to some extent it does but really you feel seen when you don't have to play along as much as you respectfully thankfully receive it and and right like you you also share what matters to you or you're opening up yourself to them and it requires a lot of vulnerability like it, yeah because, because this process of getting there hardened you and people don't understand the process you went through yeah. like the negativity of people only receive immigrants is like in the in the news or the culture as sort of this unwanted thing and it's yeah there is no language around immigration here that is positive yeah it I feels understand. like they're taking stuff away is the the common narrative right when you know by immigrating here first of all you have to pay so much money to the yeah. government which then it just gets to keep for just coming here and yeah you, are far more diligent about everything you do like you know even though you don't break the law you could be punished for so many things yeah yeah or if you break the law accidentally <laughs> uh you know like there are weird things you're just not gonna know when you immigrate here they don't tell you but but i do get your point like yeah there are a lot of like you know i mean immigration like in terms of like in general what you mentioned yeah it's really like different from the person who really immigrates in the process that they go through and there are always like this yeah I mean people do have the idea of yeah obviously you have to speak their language you might want to communicate you are constantly like learning and trying to adopt and be flexible and all again but still at the back of your head you still have that insecurity of a lot of other things so there are a lot of things that you have to be concerned but people don't know about so yeah it's kind of (laughs) like constantly being on eggshells right yeah constantly a little bit on eggshells and um that's confusing to people and another thing that's confusing uh i don't know if you have this when you're in england you have to tell me but you come to especially in america you come here and there are so many things that you've sort of seen in movies that are 
everyday things that to you feel special. <laughs> like the I was telling someone the other day, um, the first time I saw a yellow school bus, I was like, oh my god! <laughs> And my friends were like, yeah, it's a, it's a school bus. What are you, like, why are you excited about this? <laughs> and you go like, I've never seen one before. It's really weird, like, they don't understand how cool certain things are to you because you never had them. <laughs> they're like, it's just a school bus. <laughs> think they're nervous because they think you're judging them. And you're nervous because you're like, everything is like it's in the movie. Like, they don't know how much you've been trained by your culture and the world to think everything that is inherently American or English, they're superior, right? Yeah. It's a really weird thing to navigate because you do end up like, um, this year has been an interesting year because uh, some of the political issues that came up, obviously I was on the side of freedom for everybody. That's always going to be my, my stance. <laughs> Let people live in peace and have their option, like their, their, give them a chance to, to feel respected as human beings and, and live and prosper right like give them a chance to prosper and feel safe that's really the bottom line for everything for me um, and it's weird because I understand some of this stuff I read a lot of books in the past but still it's not my culture I wasn't raised with this so some of it is I, I understand it, but I never identified with it, right? I see, and it's yeah. a weird to be. You want to stand up for people, and I did in, in, a, in a variety of ways. But it looks like my opinions and my activism or whatever, it will always look different than my Native friends. Because mm -hmm. where they're reacting from is so different. You're kind of a tourist in that idea yeah. of the world, that idea of existing. And, you know, if you been aware of what a tourist you always are now when yeah. you even go to your own country you're a tourist right it you have a different kind of compassion it's you yeah. approach very differently you know especially like when you're away for some time then uh, things get um, i mean when when you are here you fed up with things but when you just sort yeah. of like stay away for a while and then come back you see it like with fresh eye and you can yeah. appreciate the stuff that you didn't appreciate it before somehow so yeah it's funny the things you end up loving um i shouldn't say you i should say me because i don't want to put words in your mouth but things i thought were interesting and cool because they were modern are not cool or interesting there is not inherently a lot of culture in them i look at when i was young i would save up and buy used discarded uh rolling stone copies of rolling stones because it's the only way I could read about the the stuff I wanted to read about, right? It's wanting to expose yourself to this kind of thinking and culture. And um, yeah. I remember that, like, it would be so expensive. And I would just go to these, like, old, <laughs> why did I? <laughs> like, it was always like this, you know, like, yeah. just to find one place, the used bookstore that would have that and you'd pay all of your pocket money to like get yeah and now back at it and it's just it's a rolling stones magazine like it was a throwaway thing for people yeah. who, who could just go and buy it but it meant so much to you and yeah i will say this much i think that drive you have to find meaning in the little bits of things you can get your hands on it does it does pay off it carries you it's it's the desire to to see things differently and that always pays off however you come back it's like it's very topsy-turvy you come back and it's not the stuff that is meaningful or deep it's the sort of like folk songs you didn't really pay attention to when you were young right it's it, it's all the stuff that feels kind of faded and dusty when you're living there and you don't you're like oh, I don't I want to be a part of that culture like it's yeah. not I'm, other, I'm the other person I'm alternative right yeah. there's this sort of wanting to identify yourself by the western things and I'm just gonna say it's totally normal it's a yeah. it's, it's driven from yeah. the same place you wanting to do something different and interesting uh yeah. it, it's good to know that and it's also good to know that in the long term the things that matter are like irrefutably your own culture. Yeah, it's, it's but I, I think it's also something that comes by uh, age and experience as well. Because it's <laughs> so like when I, I remember when I was young, I was men just wanted to be someone else, you know, like, but as you just somehow like 
grow older, see the world, see more people, see more cultures. You somehow like feel like everyone says like, again, what you just mentioned that every, everyone's like, oh, we're all human. And if you just gave people opportunities and like security and all that, they kind of like, can uh, I don't know it's the word like flourish what is inside yeah. them and and it's not like uh, yeah I mean you I think it's something that you embrace your culture and all that by age and experience but um still I know how what you mentioned that sometimes when you are living somewhere else and you hear your own traditional music or something you there's something inside you that you're like oh shit I never had this feeling before and then that's how you understand like how culture and all things this is something that is with you like you can't really say is, yeah it's really interesting right you get doctrinated into I, I I will say I felt very lucky I I um interacted with a lot of things I thought were cool when I was growing up and you get to it and there's nothing wrong with it but you're like huh is this it? Like, it's this idea that you thought you were going to reach something and then you were going to feel whole. And you reach that thing maybe and you don't feel whole. And that's the most interesting, that's the most crucial part of it, right? Because if, when you get used to that and then you hear a song and there is a texture to the emotion that arises that you've just not felt in a long time because you just don't come across it. And you feel like you belong somewhere. And it's a really difficult difficult thing to communicate to people. And I yeah. think to choose to belong to that feeling instead of pushing it away comes very naturally when, because you, yeah, you feel like you're four years old again. Um, yeah. Not to make it too topical, but, uh, you know, the idea of loss and grief come up, right? Because right now there's a lot of, pandemic related things happening is really in the forefront and i'm also genuinely curious if if your culture has the same thing yeah we have songs and sort of like poetry and things about death that are very clearly about that and they are yeah. it's the kind of sound of a neigh do you guys have neigh it's like a flute-like instrument ah uh, neigh yes 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 i thought you were saying in english word yeah neigh, neigh sounds is just makes me cry yeah, yeah oh, because yeah. I feel there's something so bittersweet about there are certain certain like turkish sounds and you know without a word what the song is about and yeah. the beauty of living is always contrasted with the acceptance and, and recognition of death. And that is something I never find so clearly, so like on the forefront. And it does exist, like there's Robert Frost poems and beautiful pieces of literature, but you can't, the way you connect with it in your own culture, you can't yeah. really connect in another language. It almost yeah. feels like the feelings get lost in translation. Like you yeah. get it mentally, but in your heart you can't feel it. And it's a really weird thing. I it it it's a beautiful tear that runs down your cheek, you know, <laughs> like you're happy. It's a happy tear. You feel like you belong. Yeah, so true. Hey everyone, this is a part that I lost the conversation and we had to re-record it. So if the vibes of the interview is not the same as the other parts, that's why. Can you please explain the process of making AR Red Riding Hood? Especially in terms of storytelling, you were choosing one of the most well-known tales, but the way that you are retelling the story is sort of uh, unique and also the medium that you have used is AR. So I want to know more about like the importance of a storytelling and the challenges that you had to making this app. What I did mostly on that project, I think, was to shoot myself in the foot and then find solutions to fix that problem. And every time we fixed something, a different thing would break. This mostly came from, you know, working with a new medium like AR in the first place and trying to figure out how to give the user some kind of purpose that fit into the original fairy tale. These, of course, were all going on top of the pitch I gave, which said, this is essentially a story about coercion. That's what happens in the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Clearly, these fables were written at a time to be cautionary tales for, in this case, young girls or little children. And when 
when the little red riding hood in the fable encounters the wolf it is not really a wolf right that actually speaks back to this little girl who is trying to go to her grandmother's house and the original take did say this was about predatory behavior I think it was about the time the Harvey Weinstein case was really coming to light and was not completely resolved that this project was pushed forward. So, you know, there are very specific limitations within our client's need, which was mainly to make this a story for children somehow. And the original age target demographic was a little bit older. And in time, it came down to being younger and the app, which wasn't out yet, really was defining itself as we were defining our project and in some ways we had to revise certain things including the tone to a different extent than really what we what i had pitched and within that of course the story had to change and the user's role had to change now what's really different from vr uh in an ar project is you know you have to make the user feel crucial to the mechanic of the story somehow but little red riding hood is a story about a young girl being alone with a wolf character in the forest uh the minute you actually put in another character in the forest it sort of goes against the story right because somebody would step in or they would be able to see that there is a problem with this wolf that's lying to this little girl who's lying to this little girl and uh that made us really struggle for a little bit uh there was a version where there was a greek choir <laughs> and elements of nature were talking to her uh as she traveled around the map for many reasons this didn't quite work and we did settle on the user being the imaginary friend or the voice in her head and you know if we are telling these uh children this story of harassment where in lies the accountability when there is harassment happening and what is any bystander's role in sort of intervening or taking part being an imaginary friend or a sort of heard voice in her head removes the user's ability to really move things around and mess with the world and change the conditions of the world but it can reframe things for her to be supportive or helpful in that case to help her stand up for herself so in a way she was supposed to be a silent character who doesn't yet know how to use her voice and as a friend and as a bystander i don't think it's a, it's really our job to speak for other people as much as it is to sort of encourage them to speak for themselves and make the conditions right so in the story we were trying to make sure that all the first of all all the controls are straightforward that you kind of actually understand how to interact with the story uh that has changed uh through the development of the app itself and also the types of engagement uh in the beginning there were i think five different things including touch and blow and i know blow is uh, a little bit on the nose for the story but jokes aside we ended up actually championing some more than others cuz it is a voice activated ar project so you know we had to then differentiate how to show an imaginary thing and then she has this thing called a confidence circle <laughs> which actually shows either more or less of what's actually around her and it is mimicking her ability to see the bigger picture or not right and and we want to make sure that she came up with a plan to beat the wolf at his own game but also that she'd be enabled to do so by our support uh there is of course sort of a responsibility element to making something for a young audience and it is very very easy to sort of just spell out to kids what they should do and in some ways we literally have to spell it out because they're reading the words that activate these motions but how do we get them to say how do we get them to be a good friend and how do we get them to say uh you know you need to stand up for yourself without saying you need to stand up for yourself <laughs> So, you know, when there's anything happening that endangers one of us, I do think it is all of our job <laughs> to to this is everybody's accountability. Uh, you know, more and more of similar compromises around different marginalized communities have come to light since this uh was made, of course. Uh 
uh, and I don't think that message has changed, but I think the medium has to reflect something of the story and the story has to reflect something essential in this medium. And that was our first, first and foremost consideration in, in how do we make good use of AR? What type of unique things can we, you know, employ here to actually make the process work within the limitations of AR and make it so that it really can't be enjoyed properly any other way, uh, not to reduce things that would work under other media types, but actually to properly make use of AR as a medium by taking advantage of its unique qualities. Uh, and at some point, I actually had to make a 2D cut of this and we couldn't do it. <laughs> a lot of it has to be faked and it really does lose its dynamism and meaning and it is almost impossible to cut it so in some way i'd like to think that's a uh, proof that we achieved one of our personal goals so let's talk about pearl it's a google project and it's one of the first vr animations that got nominated for uh, oscars and i really want to know more about how was it to make the first vr before like we are was still a thing you know and for lighting how did you make it feel like the car was moving did you have to repaint all the frames and the story itself is very emotional and i would like you to Tell me more, please, about how was it possible to tell the story within 360 degrees environment without distracting the audience and still make them want to explore and watch the movie? So do you have to add like small details to make it fun to watch or simplicity was what uh, makes it unique? I really appreciate if you just tell me all about Pearl. Pearl was a real trip. Sometimes when I look back, I can't believe we made that project happen. <laughs> and I think that's a good sign, right? That even after it's completed, it's a little mysterious sometimes. We actually had to invent quite a bit of stuff, uh, not just for the pipeline of the production design and the design of the project, but on the technical end too. When we first started Pearl, there was really very few things uh, very few knowns on the table and up until we started Pearl the most complex project that Spotlight Stories had finished was still pretty small in comparison most of these stories had one environment and maybe one or two characters and eventually they would be short films that are told in a very limiting setting because of a lot of the uh, technical difficulties of bringing these things to light. Of course, in VR, you're sort of this ghost character situated in the middle of the story. And Google Spotlight had some pretty specific ideas about what VR, what types of VR they wanted to explore. They didn't really want it to be deeply interactive. We couldn't make a half game, half narrative story. And I don't think that was the director's intent anyway. So I focused from the production design end on finding something that allowed the playfulness of, you know, the moving camera. And it is quite difficult to figure out how you should design something so it encourages the user to use their head to look around. In the car that we situated the, uh, around the camera, there's always frames within the frame, which allows for not just multiple views, but it really does focus your attention. And I, I think mostly what I experienced or saw people do is people look straight forward through the front window, the windshield, and sometimes they look to the side. And there's, there are actually many ways you can experience Pearl. Uh, there's the Google 360, which is one of the easiest interactive versions you can use. Uh, you can do it on your phone, which is a very different experience than full immersion. And the strongest experience is going to be on Vive. So if you uh, go to Steam, I think there's a version you can use there if you have the headset. And, and for instance, if you put the headset version on, you are sitting they we we in in events we would have a setup where the audience would come one at a time and they would sit in a swivel chair and the chair is sort of situated inside the car and you kind of have this experience of being immersed again sitting in the car as the car goes forward and you can kind of move your chair around enough to be sort of either closer to the front or the back these were some brilliant designs done by the rest of the team by the way uh, but they also utilize things like if you stand up for instance and the 
immersive VR version, you can look out the sunroof uh, and then kind of experience it that way, which was among my references and things I wanted to allow to happen. A lot of people don't look up, but it's actually, I thought it would be cute uh, when you're driving under trees, for instance, to see the sunroof. So besides all of that, of course, the biggest challenge for us was editing. So up until then, there was, as far as I know, no editing in Google Spotlight films. There were tricks used, such as maybe you could use a light and dim the light and uh, bring it back on to sort of create a transition. But actually film-like cuts hadn't yet occurred because those are really jarring in immersive media. You lose the trust of your audience really quickly and you have to be really mindful of how claustrophobic and how volatile it can get if you don't know something is going to cut or or as the car moves through the space of the scene, how um, if one side has a close element say if we are driving next to a cornfield and it comes very tall on the right side, then I always wanted to limit that claustrophobia on the left side or the front. So then you never really feel like things are completely closing in on, closing in on you. Uh, there are things like that, that, you know, you try to control, but you're also taking into consideration the camera and the car moving through the space. <laughs> so some of these scenes really have to be mapped out and, you know, with consideration, once again, to the amount of open and closed space, uh, negative space, if, if I may, around the story. And also, how distracting does that really become from the story happening inside the car? Can you really follow through? Uh, in some cases, I think the best and most interesting experience almost is to sit there and look out the window, which resembles family car car uh, road trips, right? So outside of all of this, of course, we had to also work with the limitations of real-time render on a cell phone, which was the main place where Google Spotlight Stories really took place. So our really brilliant mastermind, Google would explain this to me as, you know, it's not like a computer where you plug it to the wall or, or it's not like a gaming console where you have unlimited energy supply. There really is you know, only so much energy you can use from the phone at any given moment, meaning we kind of had to revert to really basic CG uh, to really pull off such an ambitious project. There were, I think, easily over 20 environments and a full cast of characters, and, and there were pretty high restrictions on what we could really render. You could only put one or two lights on objects at a time, meaning we couldn't really light scenes and we kind of went around that with this trick we had where uh, we would actually have our colorist color every scene in two different versions <laughs> inside the car. There'd be the shaded colors of the car, and then there'd be another version of the car where um, things are rendered under direct sunlight. So then we would mask between these two versions <laughs> to give, give the sense of these really graphic lights hitting the characters on the inside of the car. It, it's a tremendous amount of work just to pull off the feeling that there's actual light moving around the scene. Of course, the exterior was a little bit more forgiving, especially in this sort of low poly aesthetic. Uh, the other reason why I really love that aesthetic is it creates a sense of realism without really trying to be hyper real in any way. You know, it's the sort of thing ideally you would get in Fantastic Mr. Fox, where you have really stylized stop motion and the hair on the dolls, they shift around. And maybe in the first five minutes of the film, that feels a little bit weird. <laughs> but you you quickly get used to it and it just sort of feels like that's reality all of a sudden. So that was always the one of the many driving factors of why we had to switch to the style. But also, I really loved sort of in, uh, embodying some sense of game element, like early games having really, really vague, loose CG <laughs> and um, being rendered really simply. I grew up playing games with my brother and early Final Fantasy games and, and other, other play early PlayStation renders uh, of 3D games. They have their own sense of realism. And, and I think seeing things rendered that way 
evokes a sense of cont- wanting to control it or, or interactivity in us. Uh, now, at this point, I think mixed reality has really, it can do pretty much anything, especially when it's plugged to the wall, <laughs> as, as I was saying. Even when it isn't, right? Now you can use a headset that's uh, wireless and it will very easily render realistic CG, which is never, to me, the goal or it is never aesthetically that interesting. Limitations sort of tend to give give more freedom because you can be more expressive with what you're trying to do than what reality allows. And uh, to be perfectly honest, it feels a little bit redundant to go from reality to put on a headset to look at another reality that looks just like the reality you came from. And of course, of course, there are uh, different projects that will require that. But in our story, it's already kind of realistic. We don't have um, fancy elements like dragons and magic and other things. This is a very real story of something that could happen in real life. You know, in the beginning, we start really sweet and warm and because it looks like a vacation and, and you're supposed to kind of put together in the first half, of course, that they're living out of their car and it is not a road trip. They are homeless. So the dad um, sort of gives up his dream of chasing his own music career to settle down. And and his daughter carries on the journey of chasing after uh, dreams of becoming a musician. I don't know a lot of animated films, you know, in the sort of American um, milieu of animation that get that dark, right? Uh, We see it in international animation a little bit more. And, you know, to do a story like that justice and make it entertaining and comforting and beautiful and to really drop you in the middle of it without shaking you up in a threatening way is is really an interesting and worthwhile challenge. And, you know, there were a lot of people who would cry in the headset, which means that through an employment of, you know, sort of nuanced acting and a story with, you know, actual ups and downs, that are quite relatable. Even in such high limitations, you can really make a project um, touching and feel connectable. And that's really, really important because as soon as you put the headset on, there's this question of what am I doing here? Like, why am I here? And it becomes extremely existential. It's something that happens in AR too, but you don't lose your uh, bearings in AR. So it's not as threatening. It always feels like something that's happening outside of you to some extent, especially if you are experiencing it through a phone or an iPad, which for Wonderscope we were limited to. So, you know, you can't put a lot of really interesting, flashy things inside or outside the car while there's something really emotional happening. You know, of course, you can use some film tricks like the weather to show the emotion between the father and the daughter and, um, you know, You can use other directional tricks. For instance, as we would cut from scene to scene, we were trying to make sure that the action of the characters sort of moved continuously through the cuts. So if you are following the dad turning around and talking to Sarah, then the next time we cut, uh, there's already something happening or the action has moved, the characters have moved to the area where you were sort of looking at. If you're turning from left to right, then we're not going to, all of a sudden jerk you back to right to left, right? Uh, And all these things really do have a huge significance and and so do use of uh, surround sound. So we had, of course, because it is Google, we had wonderful engineers who would say, okay, what do you guys want? We'll invent that stuff. Uh, Nothing is impossible, which is a wonderful attitude to have. And um, we were incredibly lucky to have a completely engaged, enabling, very talented, extremely smart crew of engineers and and, um, inventors who, uh, because, you know, that is a really serious limitation that you have as an independent filmmaker that um, you don't have to worry about as much at Google, but also a really incredible sound design team, mostly um, headed by Scott Stafford. And there was an original track written for that short film. So, you know, that comes with its own limitations because you aren't really using a lot of dialogue. Most of the storytelling is coming from the song and the little bits and pieces you hear throughout the film, meaning you're not going to get a lot of characters screaming and then you turn around to see them, but it's all supposed to sort of fit into this cohesive whole. But Scott was excellent. He recorded sounds in many uh, settings and many types of 
rigs and a lot of them were very specific 360 sound recording tools and he would record things outside and inside an actual car to sort of get the right feeling and you know when you're using 360 sound the sound itself becomes a directional tool you can use to guide the audience uh this is always the case in cinema but it's really heightened here where maybe i want to turn you around or I want you to catch an, an emotional moment between them. And, you know, just like film, of course, you look at where the characters are looking at. So that's one way to really uh, grab your attention. But if you just want to listen to it, like a music video or, or a song on the actual radio, that also kind of fits into the project, which really comes together beautifully. But I know part of the question is also about the tools and we really didn't have any tools. So even to get the demo in front of ourselves and do draw overs, we would actually have to put it on a phone and somebody would have to play the entire thing on their phone, the entire experience, um, previs. And then we would have to screen capture the video on the phone screen and then basically, you know, take stills from that screen grab. Uh, there were no stitching tools available to us at the moment. There were no uh, easy headsets where you could walk in and start using a, a storyboarding tool in VR. So a lot of it was really taped together in the back and, and just the sort of joy of inventing ways of working. And for better or for worse, I think that level of indiness <laughs> really brings cool innovation because you're not, you can't really be bogged down by the idea that you might not, you might not be doing it the right way to do it. Uh, this happens in film a lot, not just in animation, that there's the tried and true way, supposedly. It's this mythical way to do things that are perfect never works out that way but i think it's easier to judge yourself and doubt your choices when there is this sort of hovering feeling of perfection and the right way to do it so i find it freeing and you know a lot of times i had to sort of try to communicate to a team of wonderful designers and and painters oh yeah like you have to sort of imagine the height of a person from outside, sorry, from inside the car when you're sitting, how tall is the nearest object and does it how, you know, how far do you see? And we really didn't have any tools. So a lot of it uh, would come down to sort of doing these long panorama paintings and then do sort of the back view and the front view of the car because layout would be quite different than the final version. And then we were trying to find ways either to steer, uh, spherically stitch the sky over the panorama or how much of the environment is going to be uh, actually modeled versus a background painting. These are a little bit weirder uh, to answer as questions when you have the car moving and it's VR. Uh, a lot of times you have to, of course, render uh, the road behind you and not just where you're looking. And, you know, it required a lot of innovation from a lot of people. So it was part of the joy, though, part of the joy of making it. <laughs> there are a lot of things in these experimental projects that never make it in. And some of those things don't make it in because they don't function well. And some of them, we just run out of time. Uh, there were a lot of things in Pearl we didn't get to make, such as speed lines and sort of, I, I there were a lot more glitch elements that I wanted to use and really take advantage of low poly. But I think at the end of the day, sometimes those tricks and stylistic things can take away from the story and the story is really meant to be a little bit heartbreaking so one way or another i hope we made you cry <laughs> you know when it comes to making any kind of interactive project you have to really pay attention to both the storyline and the the user experience a little bit separately when you're in a dark room and you have no task of solving the story I think you can relax more. And when you have a directional camera in your hand, it's very easy to forget that you are the camera. So once again, as much as you are trying to stop people from looking in the wrong places, you're also trying to make sure that they catch the action. And for instance, in Pearl, there were some triggers where the song could wait for you if you needed to find your way back to the story. Could we repeat a verse? Could, could we repeat the guitars and hold a, a verse until something happens? Could certain animations be triggered when your eye meets a certain character? They act a certain way as opposed to them just acting on their own time. And still you're trying to make this feel very natural, very unperformed in a lot of ways, uh, because that's what that story 
requires and uh in ar it can be quite different you can really hold the interaction until in our case the audience finishes reading the text uh of course there were technical problems with the the amount of syllables we could use and we had to sort of rewrite the project a few times but in the end i think if anybody is making their own ar vr projects here or other mixed reality it is really good to know that it's gonna break uh, that no matter how brilliantly you plan it it's not gonna work the way you really want it to work and uh, there's you know, getting it on a device as fast as, it, as as you can is really your best bet at, as, at understanding what really works with the medium and what doesn't. So, you know, get it on the device is the is the best uh, advice I can give if anybody is making their own stuff. Because in your mind, everything looks cool, and then you actually experience it, and some of those things really aren't that exciting. And then sometimes it's stuff you really didn't expect to have an impact at all, just throw away ideas or uh, really collateral choices you've made end up becoming the most special things in the project. And you discover new ways to, again, hold attention, respect your audience, connect with them. And those are some of the most enjoyable parts of making all these experimental tools and experimental projects. And here we go talking about storytelling style and the podcast continues as it was. Really as a designer, if you, I think if, as a production designer, if you do a good job, it feels like it couldn't have been made in any other way. And also you're completely not thinking about the style. If you're in a film thinking about the style, it means you're not in the story. Mm. If you get into it and it feels real and beautiful and rich, that's successful. If I'm sitting in a movie looking at the designs being like, wow, that design is so blah, blah, blah. And, hmm, like, I'm really not paying attention to what's happening. I'm not emotionally on a journey, right? I see. Yeah, like, you know. So, you, so like, you, you, would, you would say both, both style and you, you shouldn't get lost only into the style or anything. Uh, it's everything should be to help the story and to tries help you to convey that feeling that you want to get from the story, right? It's all about building a bridge to the audience with what mm -hmm. the piece is trying to do. And mm -hmm. yeah, the style isn't, it's one thing to make pretty things. It's another thing to like the best experience you, you, your audience can have is to feel completely lost in mm -hmm. that, in that experience. Like they yeah. believe that that thing is, real in a way right and it doesn't have to look real to feel real and thankfully um director patrick osborne he got that already yeah. but also what's gonna feel right for each technology each story each you know whatever it is that you're doing yeah it has to it has to keep in mind how the audience is gonna experience it and just try to, you know, it, it feels like a pun. I don't mean it that way, but it has to be a bit immersive. Yeah. The emotions you're putting on the screen are always in service of yeah. letting the audience connect with that emotion, not of what's happening on the screen, but in themselves, right? And if mm -hmm. you want to reach that, then I think your marching orders are pretty clear. Uh, I see. It can look like many things and reach them. So it's not really about it had to be done exactly this way. You just use your tools and whatever is available to you so mm. you can make a connection. Because everything we do at the end of the day, it's easy as artists to think that it's important because it you know, brought our dreams to life or it pleases us. But the mm. value of a network, at least for me, is not about how much it pleases me and feeds my ego. Yeah. It really is about how does this live on with people? If you can make something that affects mm -hmm. people and, and it brings them to accept those feelings in themselves or they move away feeling differently and the next step they take feels different than the one they took before they put the thing on or tried the thing on. That's the actual effect of what you make is what people are willing to take away from it so yeah. you know what I mean like the work itself actually doesn't matter and I think that's a freeing feeling for me is 
what it is doesn't matter as much as how does it allow us to see beauty or how does it allow us to connect to emotions that are there that we don't know are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and I do get this feeling that you're talking about from both, <laughs> um, I mean, from all your movies and also your drawings and all the, I don't know, the concept art or whatever you do. So um, now that you just brought this up, that you just mentioned that you want to <laughs> bring feeling to people. Can we also talk about, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen this before and I, to be honest, I just watched it recently. Your work, your personal project uh, that you directed and wrote, uh, it's called Solipsism, right? Am I saying correctly? Yeah, yeah. I co so, so it with Jonathan, though. I didn't make it alone, so I just want to throw that out Okay, there. Yeah, yeah, credit to him as well. <laughs> I, I mean, that one actually was something that I, I love both Pearl and you know, Red Riding Hood and all that. But this one was, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Because, you know, the first thing that come to my mind when I was watching it was a lot of philosophical thoughts and a lot of like quotations that I've read or, you know, a lot of like you, you, no Rumi, so we have more Lana we say in Farsi. Rumi is our shared treasure. I really like that. Yeah, it, you know. Yeah, so I mean, when I was watching it, like a lot of like quotes from him come to my mind, and a lot of that. I, I don't know. I really like want to hear more about that but one in particular that i really want to see. to me it was more like in the beginning gave me the feeling that you are the creator of your own reality kind of thing and then mm -hmm. as we were going i was having this feeling of idealism or being a maybe uh, egocentric or stuff like that and the self-image that we have from ourselves and you know like and how we are all trapped in this reflection that we have or the thoughts that we have and ideas and there was this part in particular that I really really liked that was when this I mean a spoiler alert um, I mean I put the link for people to go and watch it themselves so you can just pause here go and watch it and then come back <laughs> so this part of that this uh, there was like this fractal pieces of uh, everyone was trapped in their own kind of shape and all that and then the camera was kind of moving back and this girl was a very very like tiny piece and I just <laughs> give me the feeling that we are just this tiny thing in the universe that we are trapped in our own you know shit you know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and then then I really love the way that you played with just really simple geometric um, uh, shapes to show somehow a metaphysical word as well like there was this part that this girl's um, um, face somehow I don't know smashed or something and then she kind of you know pop it up again so I, I mean they were so simple but I just find it so deep also, I really wanted to tell you this, that, you know, like in Persian architecture and in like Islamic Iranian mm -hmm. architecture, we do have like mirror works. Are you familiar with that? Like there are um, in mosques are a lot of like pieces of mirror. Have you seen them? I think uh, I would love to see if you have something specific you're referring to, to check it out. Sim um, simply just say uh, Google like mirror work in Iranian mosque, probably. Uh -huh. You've same thing so this is like the rooms uh full of like mirrors so there are pieces of mirrors and uh, they're so glorious and beautiful but the like the main reason is also is for reflecting light and uh having this holy shiny place and all that but it also has like a lot of symbolic meaning behind that this like manifest of like plurality and unity and you yeah. know a lot of like you know like poets Persian poets and all that have write about it and a lot of like philosophical things behind <laughs> this mirror work that I mean it's really interesting that I was just like it's like I don't know five, five minutes animation or something <laughs> and it's so simple but I was just thinking about all these deep things that you know you see your reflection in the world and all that and then you're just this a uh, fractal piece of the universe. I love, so, I love that you arrived at the word fractal because I, I I read and think about it a lot, but I, I don't think I had uh, heard anyone think <laughs> about this book before. So I'm, you know, thank you for telling me how it resonated with you. Um, 
I'm aware of those things for being coming from a different mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Like all those things are always really present for me in my day to day interactions with people. But there was absolutely no intention of wanting to sound philosophical. You know, it wasn't trying to be smart necessarily. I think it was trying to make sense of a lot of emotion about conformity and about what we pick up from the world around us about how we are supposed to present ourselves or what looks like it would solve our problems. It's a thing we all go through, not just little girls, right? And we mm-hmm. keep going through it throughout our lives. So. I think it came at a time where I was feeling that for multiple reasons in different aspects of my life. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it comes with that language because that's the language of how I think, not because I was trying to be philosophical. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for you, it was just like a a story that you felt connected and you wanted to tell. But yeah, but me to me as an audience, maybe (laughs) it's because it's my issue these days. So that's that's how I saw it. So I was like, wow. I I don't. I'm not saying that's also. There's no wrong way to see it. But what you're saying resonates with how I what I was doing. It just Mm -hmm. wasn't trying to signal that to someone as much as trying Mm. to communicate the emotion, if that makes sense. Like if if you felt through all of that, sort of what she was going through and that resonated with you, that was the goal not to, do you know what I mean? Like then then I'm ready. And (laughs) that's kind of where I was coming from. Uh, I think in, in real life too, I tend to talk about these types of things which sometimes confuse people because they're like we're talking about carrots why are you talking about this but to me (laughs) there's this bigger picture that's always right in front of me and you know like that was that was very much part of what I was going through then too so yeah it was never sort of trying to make people guess what things represent but creating a certain vagueness that allows people to come to how they feel this Because, you know, kind of speaking about what we were saying regarding different cultures and being a guest in someone else's culture and so on. It doesn't always feel right to me. Actually, it feels completely wrong to me to pick up sort of American movie language necessarily. Or do you know what I mean? Like, I know what that looks like. I can work in that system to some extent. But what I have to say and and how I feel is not what they think the world is. Mm-hmm. I I experience world as a Turkish woman who's lived here and like all the things that apply to me specifically. So if I'm if I want to show loneliness and I'm doing it with a boy sitting in church and there's no one around or something like that's not how I would yeah. symbolize it. And my thinking is mm-hmm. more abstract. And I. You know, without getting too deep into it, I think countries that have an Islamic background have a different idea of iconology because there was the idea of the iconoclast, right? We destroyed the ideas of impersonating emotions as as people, embodying deep concepts as like a figurative thing. It doesn't exist in the same way in our culture. We use symbols. We use something a little bit more environmental like kind of like what you're saying the idea of duplicity and plurality is yeah in our yeah in our understanding of visual representation in yeah. terms of, there's mosaics like i know there's shared ideas of sim- symbolizing things in our cultures right mm-hmm. to me that's interesting because if that's where you are and you want to communicate that to people how do you do it this idea yeah. Yeah, like picking uh, very metaphorical things from American culture to represent your feelings and thoughts that don't belong in these boxes. It, I, I admire it. I love the amount of ingenuity that goes into making Western films. I enjoy them. But I'm always aware of the fact, ever since I was little, that I have to jump through the hoops of oh, there's all this Christian I, I, I like symbolism in this. And you know what I mean? That's not natural to us. That's not our language. So yeah, yeah I see. Maybe maybe that's why I just get a lot of like, um, <laughs> I don't know, signs or yeah, because to, 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 yeah, to me, it really just especially like because uh, we both, of course, are familiar with Rumi poets. So um, I mean, a lot of like quotes from him just 
come into my head. I was like, wow, okay. His belief also isn't about one iconography, right? It's not about yeah. one religion. It's really he's talking about divine love, which has not a direction towards a single god or anything. Like, yeah. It's about being one with the world and connecting with the people around you and the world itself. And it's a very different way of looking at, at the world than, yeah. than, yeah, like believing there is a hierarchy of access to God, right? Like yeah, yeah. a different way of looking at the world. But at the, at the end, even if people choose to look at it that way, which in its own way is also equally beautiful, right? There's no, yeah. I'm not one thing above the other. It takes... Yeah sometimes to realize everybody's just trying to belong and love the world and yeah some of the semantics are getting in the way but their love for everybody else is just as pure as your love for everybody else and yeah it's good yeah. to then find a new language that maybe doesn't have to resort to someone else's way of describing something it inherently yeah. says to me that we have something to offer that's different but it comes from the same sentiment of yeah yeah like accepting yourself and others and it's everything is everything kind of finds its way down there i think at the end of the day like yeah i actually did write a quote from him um, um so i'm going to oh, read yes. it for you yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it's, it's english but uh, i'm pretty sure that in persian is pretty much different and i don't know the persian one here oh, yet right. but it says that you are a mirror reflection a noble face the universe is not outside of you look inside yourself everything that you want you are already there so yeah that's what i get from your it made me smile thank you <laughs> oh I, I wish i could give you a hug but yeah someday when that doesn't kill people we'll, meet <laughs> yeah, each yeah. Other and we'll give each other like big middle eastern hugs you know <laughs> yeah definitely so yeah that that's i really like one of those um animations that i watched and there was like a lot of thoughts coming to my head and yeah i just really want to tell you this coach from him because yeah <laughs> that's how i felt Thank you so much. I appreciate how um, how open that is and how thoughtful that is. Thank you. So yeah. can you also like tell me how your mind process work in terms of like, because, you know, like your your the sketches that you are putting out there and the concepts are you, for example, work. I mean, the current ones, you're having this red background or something. And then for Corona, uh, you had working with this people with masks and all that. And you always have like somehow I mean, I'm telling you, I just found you a very deep person. So. Thank you so much for your kindness. But. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, they're really like minimalistic and simple and usually like sometimes with a brushwork or a line or even if you're doing the digital work, you somehow put uh, layers of texture or I specifically really love your glitch art a lot, like they're <laughs> usually stunning. So I really want to know like what makes you like yeah. How, how does it work for you? Like you, I don't know, is it like a marker is in front, on your desk and you just feel like you want to play around with it and you just go with like, I don't know, pink marker and uh, play with it or you just think about, okay, I want to work in the subject of Corona or just it just naturally comes to you. I really want to know like, because um, it sort of had a, a routine, I feel like you work with a certain color or certain style and then you switch to another thing and you have a really versatile style. So you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if the answer will be as satisfying as uh, your question, but <laughs> um, <laughs> usually it's really not that planned. As oh, okay. It's like I, 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 so I had this practice for years now where I make something every day I didn't start it because I was posting on Instagram it's much older and um, at first it was to just get better at what I was doing mm -hmm. and explore different things because uh, honestly if you only do commercial work for instance the stuff that will come out of you are only commercial work and then I think it's easy to think that's all you do right you need in order to kind of commit to your own growth you have to do the things that excite you and that's not always going to line up with your work work yeah. so i first started sort of thinking more um practically in, in in doing something every day but in a very short amount of time it turned into sort of how i process things um yeah, yeah like it's very human that 
even when you try and you're at your best, you're not processing everything in the moment it's happening to you. Like the goal, if I had one, would be to get better at that and, and always yeah. be present. But I'm honestly, I'm not. Like that would be great, but I'm human. <laughs> I don't have oh. full access to processing things because that's how it works, right? Like something else is more urgent, it feels. It's never more urgent, but it feels that way. And it, it, so, so knowing I'm going to make something every day, I think my brain is also picking up on things after years, right? Like it picks up on things that catch my interest. And I'm always, I'm not always sure why I'm drawn to something, but I know when I'm drawn to something. And sometimes that haunts me a little bit. Yeah. And more throughout something like Corona, no matter how much work you do to deal with your emotions, they catch you off guard. You know, it's yeah. really to see that in other people too, that they're reacting from feeling overwhelmed and and so am I, right? So it's just nice to try to get to the bottom of those feelings in a way. And so a certain thing just comes out and then I, if I have more to explore in that area that I'm not done with that emotion yet, it's yeah. sort of like an obsession, right? Like it's infatuation with understanding that emotion. So mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, I'm not forcing myself to come up with that so much. It's not like I'm going to yeah. drain this, that, but I want to understand it. And when I understand it and I no longer feel like it, then I naturally want to make something else. So. Yeah, and, and it is really more about, I think, finding clarity in that. And hence, it's, uh, I usually go for the shortest way to describe it. I don't like rendering. <laughs> uh, we could say that I'm like, <laughs> but also, yeah. I don't think every, there's this general feeling I don't agree with, that the most rendered, most, most realistic version of everything is the best way to communicate everything. And it isn't. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about something dark and funny and bittersweet, to make it look like a Marvel movie is not the most direct way to reach your audience. It comes back down to that thing I discussed with, yeah. right, like XRVR. It's creating a form that feels right for that thing. And I can't tell who's going to relate to it and if it's going to work for people. But it's leaving the right door open. So then if other people want to kind of experience this thing with you and go and explore this emotion with you you're inviting them you're you're it's it's a light-hearted invitation to go there and you, have, you can do it on your own time like you don't owe me anything I'm just saying I'm here and I'm experiencing it and if you are too you also belong like we don't need to <laughs> do you know what I mean it doesn't have to be yeah yeah hearted it's and you can't discard emotions anyway you, you go through them one way or another you either resist and go through them it sucks yeah. or just accept them and and slowly work your way through them and we're all struggling with the same thing we're all we all have humans yeah. so you know it's not going to resonate with everybody but that's also not my job right it's it's being as honest as I can be and hopefully other people feel less alone and that means a lot so Ah, uh, you just made me so emotional. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Right. No, no. Oh, it's yeah. because yes, ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I really, I'm really enjoying this, and um, I think these are like when when people just talk about their raw feelings and their real feelings. That's how, what really hits me, and I'm like, yeah, that's it. You know. My ink style is very somehow. I mean, people. I mean, regularly just say, "Oh, it's so dark. You have very like dark mindset or something." I'm like, no. It's just like me trying to get some sort of like feeling outside, you know, my soul yeah. and on paper. So I mean, your your way is with you just said like I'm very uh, somehow abstract and minimal, but um, they they still like I I can still like feel related to them. But like mine is more like a splatter of colors and I don't know, like edgy. Um, but it doesn't uh, matter. Like, there are so many ways you could yeah. say the same thing. And I think that's why yeah. it, it really helps that people have different styles and different looks. Because yeah. I could do something about that. It could look very minimal and kind of nonsensical to a lot of people. And then you might do 
something about the same kind of feeling about death and it might be colorful and that's gonna reach the person who needs it to be colorful to process that thing and that's why it's beautiful fractals coming back into the uh, <laughs> conversation here that's why it's so beautiful that people have different ways of expressing similar yeah. thoughts like i as i got older it became easier to accept uh, uh basically i was saying you you and i can both talk about death right or like the difficulty of grief or something and i might do it my version might look like four weird lines that don't represent anything to the same person who might see it in your art rendered colorfully mm -hmm. differently and they need to see it colorfully to accept that go there that's the door they recognize so if we're all kind of opening these doors and whoever can can connect with it you know that's why i believe everybody should do the stuff that they really want to do because yeah it's really not about convincing people they should feel that way it's about knowing that there are people who think like you who are actively looking to connect and when they come across your work they connect with it kind of naturally they may not put it in those words right it may not be yeah. so so cerebral in a way and that's the beauty of it that it doesn't have to be um over intellectualized there is a language of emotions and connections and visuals that don't belong in words it never sounds right it never describes the actual thing that's why it's beautiful that we do it differently and yeah and we're just forming we're opening doors to other people and that's the most exciting part honestly so true and i think one of the best compliments that you can get is when people say oh i can relate to this and you're like yay <laughs> yeah so, so thank you yeah. for relating to my work i i don't take it for granted and i it, it's very touching so thank you uh, oh thank you in the um actually you wrote in your uh, social media in your instagram that you are intensively interested <laughs> in your real life so <laughs> i can imagine that uh, you are so. it's such a weirdo thing to write and honestly i like being very goofy about it so i don't want to take it too seriously you know because <laughs> uh, it reflects on your work and it um, shows how observant you are of course so um <laughs> would you like to say anything for uh, like the ending or um to people out there or whatever just microphone is yours <laughs> feel free to say something to wrap this up uh well I think wherever everybody is, I know that it's a different, difficult time and it's hard to want to make stuff and that if, if they're feeling that block, it's natural that there's no race to do stuff. You don't have to spend this very difficult time judging yourself about your output or anything <laughs> like that. And just being present is work enough and that's a lot of work. So that first first and foremost um just how beautiful it is that we're alive and how special <laughs> that is to begin with uh and and also if if you are in in another part of the world and not have immediate access to certain industries or groups or companies or people you probably have something different and in your own color and style and ability to say and I hope you keep that alive as much as you get involved with like the commercial work because it's not something to be taken for granted or dismissed. And we do dismiss it when we're trying to go after very reasonable goals of trying to set up a life for ourselves and feel safe. So all those things you're feeling are real. They're very, very real. And mm -hmm. please don't be convinced that they aren't because other people may not feel the same way or recognize those things it's it's easy to feel dismissed in that case um if you needed someone yeah. to say that to you <laughs> please um take it from me just as a person and and you know as a human more so than like i know what i'm doing <laughs> but like <laughs> should be fun and hopefully your story will be very much yours and not like yeah. the other people you're kind of wanting to it will be so much more interesting than their story i can guarantee you so <laughs> Yeah, literally, like everyone have uh, something to say in their own way. So your voice and your feelings are valid. So just yeah. 
yeah don't lose them or yeah i guess <laughs> don't let the sparks in you get dull <laughs> yeah, you'll get better at being yourself like it's inevitable if you have that goal you'll get better at it and that's pretty yeah. cool time you know it takes time yeah i'm telling you it's something that comes with like asian experience i think because because i i am actually especially like this year with this uh, corona i i had to like um think about myself more than before i guess like not as if i didn't but you know you just get to know to the point that you are like oh my god who am i what i want uh, what should i do you know so you're just questioning yourself and you're just somehow i guess figure it out by time so don't yeah, worry. <laughs> everyone's going through it. Even the, especially the more successful people, like they're all going through it. It's it's just a thing. It's just a fact of life, and you're not alone. And it's it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're doing you're doing better than you think you are. Like whoever is listening. <laughs> yeah, then, don't worry. It's just the way it is. So <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, exactly. Just don't worry. Uh, thank you so much, Tuna. I really, really enjoyed talking with you. And I've, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a roller coaster of emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me and sharing with the roller coaster. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this podcast. And once again, a big shout out and massive thank you to Tuna for being so generous with her time to re-record some of the questions that I had for her. Please don't forget that you can follow me on every podcast platform such as iTunes, Google, Anchor, CastBox, and so much more plus social medias, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, at sign Art. it's A-R-E-Z-O-U-R-T, and you can find me in every platform under the same name. I would truly appreciate if you spread the love and share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, see you very soon.